So now you should be world experts on drawing Lewis structures to describe molecules. You then should be world experts in terms of taking those Lewis structures, applying the rules of VESPA, or VESGA, as I like to say, in order to determine the three-dimensional shape. The last step in our rudimentary explanation of molecular structure is to determine whether or not a particular molecule is polar or not. And in later lecture series, in fact all the way through the course, you're going to see the ramifications of whether or not a molecule is polar or not polar. Now what do I mean by polar? Well you're already familiar with the concept that bonds can be polar. Polar just means that the two ends are different. So in the case of bonds, one end is slightly positive, it doesn't have the electron density that it should do. The other end, slightly negative, it's got that extra electron density. And the way that we determine whether or not a bond is polar is we just look at the electronegativity differences between the two atoms. Well, the same broad concept applies to molecules. Molecules can be polar, one end slightly positive, the other end slightly negative. In other words, if you approach one end of the molecule, you'll see an area that's electron deficient. It doesn't have the electron density it should do, it's slightly positive. If you go around to the other end of the molecule, you'll see where that excess electron density has gone, the slightly negative end. And the polarity of molecules is due to the sum of those polar bonds, adding up any polar bonds within a molecule. So obviously a molecule cannot be polar if it does not contain at least one polar bond. The classic example of polar molecules or non-polar molecules is carbon dioxide and water. Nice simple molecules. You look at carbon dioxide and it has polar bonds. Oxygen much more electronegative than carbon, so these two oxygens are sucking electron density away from those shared electrons in the bond. The carbon slightly positive, each oxygen slightly negative. Water, also triatomic, also has polar bonds. The oxygen more electronegative than hydrogen, and so therefore uh, the oxygen slightly negative, each hydrogen slightly positive, the oxygen has more electron density than it should do. So you look at these two molecules, both got three atoms, both got polar bonds, carbon dioxide, non-polar, water, polar. Now I'm going to introduce three ways to think about it, three ways to determine whether or not a molecule is polar. The first way is the pure way, but of course is also the one that requires a little bit more skill on your part. The middle way is something that's a little bit easier to see, but again not theoretically as satisfying, and then the last way is pretty much just the cheat way in which to do it, but of course is also the easiest way to do it. So the rest of this movie, three ways to determine whether or not a molecule is polar. So the classic way to describe this is to say that polar bonds are like vectors. They have direction and they have size. And it's the direction more than the size that we're going to really focus on today. Okay, If we think of having the delta minus as pulling electrons towards it. Okay, So if they're pulling electrons towards in the delta minus direction of a bond, well then what that means is that the electrons are moving in that direction, creating that imbalance in electron density that of course ultimately leads to polarity. And what we're looking at here is the net pulling effect. So if we think of carbon dioxide, each oxygen being delta minus is pulling electrons, but look at how they're pulling them. They're pulling them in exactly opposite directions, therefore they cancel out. And if they cancel out, there's no dipole. Water on the other hand, you got pulling in this direction. Okay, The oxygen delta minus is pulling electrons in that direction, it's also pulling electrons in that direction. So what's going to happen when you look at the net pulling effect when you combine these vectors? Well obviously the horizontal component for this one going to the right will cancel out the horizontal component for this one going to the left. But on the other hand, the verticals don't cancel, the verticals add to each other. You've got a vertical component for this bit, a vertical component for this bit that goes both go in the same direction um, as we show here. So therefore, overall, water has got a dipole. That pulling of electrons doesn't completely cancel out. Various ways we write this, 
Um, here's our water molecule. We can write that net pulling in this direction, starting off with a sort of fake positive sign at the bottom, showing the direction of the electron pull, going there for one end being slightly positive, the other end being slightly negative. Another way that I'm going to use as we go through the next few movies is I would depict a polar molecule as being an ellipsoid where we've got a slightly positive end, slightly negative end. Okay, if you approach water from this side, you see the slightly positive bit. If you approach it from this side, you see the slightly negative bit. Okay. However, you approach carbon dioxide, there is no asymmetry in the distribution of electron density. Another way to think about polar molecules is thinking of the centers of positive and negative charge. If we think about carbon dioxide, okay, the center of the slightly positive charge is the carbon atom because that's the only slightly positive in there, okay, right on the carbon atom. What's the center of the slightly negatives? Well, slightly negative here, slightly negative there, but the, sli the center of those slightly negatives is smack in the middle of them, which happens to be the carbon atom. So the centers of both the delta positive and the neg delta negative charges are the same. They're both at that carbon atom. As a result, the molecule is nonpolar. Think of water. Where's the center of the slightly positive charge? Well, you've got slightly positive charge there, slightly positive charge there. What's the center of it? Right there in the middle of the two hydrogens. Where's the center of the slightly negative charge? Well, the only slightly negative charge is the oxygen, so there is the oxygen atom. So the slightly positive charge center here, the slightly negative charge center there, those centers are different, therefore we have a dipole. So second way to think about polar molecules, you say well, where's the center of the slightly negative charge? The slightly negative atoms, where's the center of the slightly positive atoms? If they're the same as we saw with carbon dioxide, there's no dipole. If they're different, then there is a dipole. Let's apply that to a slightly tougher example, one that is very easy to dupe students into thinking that's the wrong answer. CH2F2. Now, if you draw this as a Lewis structure like this, and you're not thinking straight, you'll say, oh, that's no problem. Yes, we got polar bonds in there. The carbon is slightly positive. The fluorines are slightly negative. Fluorine, of course, being the most electronegative atom. But the center of the positive charge is the carbon. The center of the slightly negative charge is also the carbon. It's not polar. This is so easy. Well, not so fast, my friends. Now, of course, over here in Wales, you don't appreciate that, but that was a phrase made famous by a chap called um, Lee Corso, who was a famous college football, and by that I mean American football, not the stuff we actually use your feet to play, um, famous college football analyst. And he would sort of talk about a prediction and blah, 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 and a game and build it up one way, and then we go, not so fast, my friends. Well, that's just what I've done. Because, of course, what you have forgotten when you're thinking this is that the carbon with four groups of electrons is not going to be two-dimensional. It is going to be a three-dimensional tetrahedron. Now, let's think about the various ways in which we can approach our theories. Okay, Carbon slightly positive, fluorines slightly negative. Fluorines are Pulling the electron density then, this carbon-fluorine bond in this direction, this carbon-fluorine bond in that direction. And so overall, they're going to be pulling it in this direction here. When you put together those two vectors, you see one going smack in the middle. So therefore, according to the vectoral approach, this is a polar molecule. Let's think of it from the center of the slightly positive and slightly negatives. Center of the slightly positive is, of course, the carbon atom. Center of the slightly negatives is smack between the fluorines there. Those two centers are different. Thus, this is a polar molecule. Either way, you slice it because the molecule is tetrahedral. Now our little cheating method, the third way in which you can look at a molecule and decide very, very quickly, is this thing polar? First of all, are there polar bonds in the molecule? If no, cannot be polar. 
And I should point out that at least at this early level of things, we consider hydrocarbons not to be polar. Right? Don't even look any further. You assume all those carbon-hydrogen bonds cancel each other out. If on the other hand, there are polar bonds in the molecule, then we ask ourselves, are there lone pairs on an atom that has polar bonds? Because remember, what these lone pairs do is they distort the geometry. If you distort the geometry, you're going to make it impossible in most cases for those polar bonds to cancel out. Okay, so if the answer is yes, it's going to be polar. Now, there is a little star there for when one is looking at higher level Lewis structures and higher level applications of VSEPR, in which there are a few examples in which lone pairs cancel out. Okay, if, we think, if you're in the foundation course, don't worry about it. If you're in the first year chemistry, well then, if you've got a linear molecule, when you've got um, five or six groups of electrons, those lone pairs cancel out. If you have a square planar structure, so that's where you've got six groups of electrons, four bonding, two lone pairs, those lone pairs cancel out. On the other hand, just about all the time, if you've got lone pairs on a central atom that has polar bonds without any issue, that molecule is polar. What about if there are no lone pairs on a central atom that has polar bonds? Then you say, all right, have you got at least one central atom where the attached atoms are different electronegativity from each other? It needs to be a fairly decent electronegativity difference. If the answer to that is yes, then it's polar. <clears throat> if it's no, then it's non-polar. So let us apply these simple rules to three molecules. Carbon dioxide. Are there polar bonds in the molecule? Absolutely, yes. Are there lone pairs on that central atom that has polar bonds? Well, there's the carbon, no lone pairs on it, so the answer to question two is no. Question three, are the atoms attached to that central atom different electronegativities? Well, they're both oxygens. Oxygen has the same electronegativity as another oxygen, so the answer to question three is no, thus it is nonpolar. H2O. Are there polar bonds? Absolutely. Is there a lone pair on a central atom that has those polar bonds? Absolutely. And so that means without further ado, it is polar. Finally, the sneaky nasty one, CH2F2. Are there polar bonds? Yep. Are there lone pairs on that central atom? Nope. So question three, are the atoms attached to that central atom different electronegativities from each other? Well, there's fluorines and hydrogens. Do fluorines and hydrogens have very different electronegativities? Yes, they do. Thus, it is polar. Going to revisit polarity and its applications numerous times throughout your life in chemistry. Hopefully, one of these three ways, ideally the first one, has resonated with you in terms of being able to look at a molecule and very quickly determine polarity or not. And if polar, which end is the slightly negative bit, which end is the slightly positive bit. See you later.